So analysis of the companies can be a fairly confusing matter. There are all the variables, there are a lot of things to be considered, and so it's quite confusing to be honest. But we don't have to worry because in the past many investors have actually come up with a lot of different techniques to actually make this sort of analysis far more easier, far more accessible. One of those investors was Phil Fisher. He was one of the mentors of the great Warren Buffett and a writer of an incredible book called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. In his book, he describes basically the four dimensions of value investing when it comes to growth companies. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at those four different dimensions and looking at how we can apply his knowledge into our daily investment strategies. So the first dimension of value investing is the present value or the present situation of the company. Basically, it's all about how the company has been ran up to this point and what it actually presents when it comes to the characteristics of the whole business. In his book, he describes four different variables that are basically essential for the company to be extremely good in this present valuation. So the first part is low cost production, meaning that the company needs to be one of the uh, lowest cost producers in the industry that it has. What this means is that they produce the products or the services at a far lower cost than most of their competition. What this allows them to do is to basically have higher margins and the higher the margins, the more profit that they have and the more expansion that they have to the industry, but it also gives them a huge protection against the basically the any market situation that can occur. So they basically have a cushion that uh, they can use if something bad happens in the economy. In the times of today especially, we can see how important uh, it is for the companies to be the lowest producers in their industries. The second part is having a strong marketing organization. This goes without saying, but if you cannot sell the product, no matter how good it is, uh, your company is going to fail. So it's important for the management to actually be able to understand how to sell to the customers and understand what are the customers in the first place and to basically make the product that they are developing into something that's very appealing to the customers. The third part is to have an outstanding research and development. Now, this is a little bit outdated, but up to this point, it's still pretty relevant. There are two ways the companies can evolve. They can either innovate and basically improve their business, or they can basically sell the exact same product and try to capitalize on the things that have, they have already done and basically end up giving their position to the competition who is innovating. So in a way that innovation is basically essential for any companies, breaking status quo is actually one of the most important things to keeping any company alive for extended period of time. We have seen countless examples of companies that simply have not adapted to the current market situations and as a result, they basically got pushed out of the market completely. And the last thing that they need to have is great financial skill. This applies, of course, to the management who needs to really, really understand where their best products are and where their need to cut costs. Every business has many departments and many moving parts, and it's essential to understand which one of those is actually making money or losing money and which one is important to the business or not important to the business. A company that has a great financial skill can actually end up having a great picture of exactly what they are doing and that basically allows them to make adjustments on the go and most of those companies have incredible efficiency. We can see that by looking at the metrics such as return on equity or in turn on the assets of the business. If those values are very high, we can be sure that that business has incredible, incredible value offering and that they know exactly what the hell they're doing, basically. But with anything else, the past most of the time does not dictate how the future is going to be. So the second value is actually looking at the prospects of the future growth. So how do we do that? Well, it's not that difficult, actually. 
we need to basically look at what runs the business or better who runs the business meaning the management the management has basically everything to do with the past results and they will be having everything to do with the future results if we can guarantee that the management is of the top quality then we can be sure that the results that they had in the past and the things that they did produce in the past can be replicated and improved upon in the future so there are many metrics that can show us how efficient the management actually is and none of them are really going to show you the whole picture so you really need to take them all in and understand which ones are going to give you the most value as an investor so the first one is comparing the salary of the ceo to the other members of the top management this can basically give us the picture if the ceo is sitting on a very high rank or not and if he has a basically the same salary as most of other management then this can pretty much give us a good look at how humble he is and, and that the fact that he cares more about the company than necessarily his own pay. This is of course not a math and we cannot assume that even if he does receive a really really high salary he is not good. The other thing is we can compare the salaries both of management and of the CEO to other companies both in the same industry and in other industries. If you want to find that out, basically look up for any company and then look for the proxy statements of those companies. Most of them have them in their SAC filings. So in that we can basically find all if not most of the information that we need to know about the salaries of the top management. If the company CEO is retiring or is leaving the company and the new CEO needs to come, it's a big red flag if a CEO is brought from the outside. Why? Because most of the times he's going to make changes, he's going to make restructurings and well that restructuring might actually be a good thing for the company the issue is, if we're going to make an investment, that restructuring is basically going to slow down the growth of the company and the expansion of the company very significantly. This means that our money can be far better employed if we invest in a company that's not actually going through a restructuring period of time. And the last is that company needs to be focused on the growth and not on the immediate profits. As we've seen before, companies really need to focus on the growth and if they always talk about just how they're going to make the most money out of the product out of the service that they're producing right now uh, they're not going to have that much longevity so a company that can both focus on the current uh, on the current profitability of the company and of the products that they're selling as well as on the future investments can be one of those catalysts that keeps on growing and growing for decades to come. And the third dimension is the profitability. This is quite paradoxical since we were just discussing how profits are not as important as the growth, but profit margins are essential for any company to keep running and keep being the industry leader. As we have already seen, they can protect the company against the downturns of the economy, but also they give a far better margins that the company can then reinvest into other products and expand their business which is something that we really want to see so once again this is a very very important part but it also needs to be managed and basically balanced with the growth opportunities that companies actually have the best profitability metrics as is of course the net margin of any business uh, and as well as the return on assets and return on equity as we have already discussed those two metrics combined together can show how efficient as well as how profitable is the whole entire business the only problem with high margin companies is the competition when there is a company that has huge amount of profits and huge margins there is going to be competition that's going to come in and try to steal the market share from that company so there are two ways that companies can protect themselves against that competition. Number one is by basically creating a monopoly where they are the only players in that market. This of course is illegal and even if it does happen, it's not going to happen for that long of a period of time. And so we are basically screwed in that situation because competition is going to still 
be there no matter what due to the current laws that are in effect. The second one is far better and something that we should all be looking for and that is the efficiency with which they are making their product. If the company has better efficiency they can basically outplay any competition due to that fact and simply just dominate because they are more efficient at making them which again relates to the first point of the organization that has the lowest cost production. So it's kind of all interlinked and uh, a great company in the first part most of the time is a great company in this third dimension. And the fourth and the last dimension is the price that we pay for those companies. The rule here is basically that the price is the reflection of the expectations that the investors have of the growth of the company. So in this situation, if we understand the company far better than most people, we can actually understand if it's undervalued or overvalued. So for example, if a company has a projection of 10% growth, and in reality you know that the company can have much more than 20%, then in all truthness it's undervalued. And of course if the company has that 10% growth projection and you know for a fact that the management is not capable enough to sustain that growth over the time and is not going to probably not going to make that return in the X amount of time, then the company is basically overvalued. With that, we can basically see and understand how well the market works and which companies work for you. Once again, all of this then depends on the, um, on the abilities of the investor and on the patience that we can have. If we want to have the absolute best deals, we need to be prepared to go through many, many, many 10Ks and to search for many, many companies in order to find those amazing deals where the company is projected to growth at a far lower percent that it actually will be growing and those are opportunities that still exist and they always exist because of the market discrepancies but they need to be searched for so it once again it really comes down to the abilities of the investor so those are the four dimensions that are essential to finding an incredible investment in the growth companies of course there are many many different variables to go along with all of those four dimensions and I've only mentioned a few of them because of the little time that we have. But again, if you follow those four examples, if you follow those four principles, you can basically be sure that you can find a very interesting company that can give you quite a bit of value in the end. So let me know what you think about those four different dimensions, which one is your favorite and what do you think is most important to look for into when you're trying to find those types of investments and have you ever even found one of these uh, kind of unicorn companies that is projected to grow at the, at the far less than what it actually is going to grow and uh yeah see you next time bye bye